Scroll down. We will get started in 30 seconds. The people tuned in can see you. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody on Facebook and on Zoom. Okay, we're gonna start. Welcome to Discovery Park of America's February Lunch and Learn. For those of you who are not already aware, Discovery Park of America is a 100,000 square foot museum and 50 acre heritage park located here in Union City, Tennessee. Our mission is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. One of the ways we do that is with programs like this one. Ordinarily, we would be doing things like this in our museum and in our park, but we're grateful that we have Zoom and Facebook to provide an alternative until we can turn the page on the pandemic. We encourage you to ask questions today. There's a, um, a box down at the bottom where you can use to ask questions, or you can also, if you're watching on Facebook, you can ask questions just in the comments. Now let's get started. Philip Jett is a retired corporate and tax attorney who calls Nashville home now, but he was born here in Union City. He attended Hornbeak Elementary School. Uh -huh. He was valedictorian of O'Brien County Central High School. He went on to receive his bachelor's law and graduate law degrees at the University of Tennessee and the NYU School of Law in New York. After a distinguished and successful career in law, he retired but put his laptop to good use. Previously, he spent his days drafting federal legislation and making sure the I's were dotted and the T's crossed on the contracts of entertainers and athletes. Now he gets to spend his days researching historical topics and crossing the T's on drafts of his own books. His first nonfiction book, The Death of an Heir, was named one of the best true crime stories of 2017 by none other than the New York Times. His second book, Taking Mr. Exxon, The Kidnapping of an Oil Giant's President, will be released in May, and that's really what we're going to talk about here today. Philip has two sons, Austin and Brandon, but I'm going to let him shout out to his Union City kin himself. I know some of them are listening, so welcome, Philip. Well, thank you, Scott. It's great to be here, and uh, thank you to Discovery Park of America, and I would prefer to be there in person, as you say. You've got a beautiful museum and uh, give me a chance to see my relatives because they always tell me I don't come home enough even though I have lived there many many years but Union City and the area of O'Brien County is home to me still and it's good to be here. And I know your mom lives here and well. my mom, my sister, uh, I've got a brother in New Bern, I've got lots of aunts and uncles and cousins and yeah you know we're we're still you know um a menace to society there, and uh, <laughs> but it's it's a great place to be, and I enjoy when I visit. Well, tell us a little bit about growing up around here. A lot of, a lot of folks who are listening are from here, so tell us about your old haunts. Yeah, well, you know, um, I was born in Union City. My family lived in the city at that time, and then moved out to eventually uh, Rufus Lake. Sandburg, which at that time I've told people was a pretty rough place. Uh, and then we moved up on the bluff into the woods and I had a pretty isolated childhood. You know, this was before, um, you know, internet and that sort of thing. Um, but I was lucky, I was fortunate. You know, I had a beautiful lake uh, to fish on and I had the woods and to play in and I had lived within walking distance of both sets of grandparents. So from that respect, you know, it, it was a great childhood, you know, and I think of it finally still. My kids, you know, grew up in a suburb of Nashville, you know, with house after house after house, no woods, no lakes, unless you went there. So they've missed out, you know, and their grandparents were far away. So they've missed out, I think, in that respect. And I was fortunate to have but I did go to Hornbeak Elementary. I throw out the Hornbeak folks. Um, you know, I think Hornbeak kind of looked down on Sandberg at the time. I don't know if that still happens there. You know, watch out, guys. Um, <laughs> and, you know, O'Brien County Central was great. Got, you know, I, I tell my kids, and some people disagree, but the friends you make in childhood, even if you don't see them for decades, 
still remain your friends. And with Facebook and all that, it allows me to reach out, keep up with them, their kids, now their grandkids. And it's tremendous, you know, what Facebook has allowed me to do with all those folks that I still think about. So did you write um, as, as a youngster? You know, it's funny. Um, I have to give, yeah, a shout out to a couple of teachers at Hornby. Um, and one is deceased, one's still there. Ronnie Yose was my history teacher. And um, Peggy Short was an English teacher for me. And they were both wonderful in the fact that they, you know, wanted me to, to fine tune whatever skills I had, even as a kid. And they came to me once in the sixth grade. And the Daughters of American Revolution were having um, a contest about, you know, writing a little story about somebody from the Revolutionary War. So I, they asked, they came to me, Peggy and Ron, and they asked me to write this. And this was in the sixth grade, you know, and so I write it and don't think much about it. And I win like in the region, but that's kind of it. And then the next year they came to me and asked me to write another one, but I didn't like the topic. I was already picky at that moment, you know. And then the eighth grade, they came back and said, here's one. So I wrote it. I won third in the state you know, against both public and proprietary, you know, schools. So I felt that there was something even early on that, you know, I loved writing and telling a story. And I didn't talk as much then as I do now, but uh, <laughs> it did start early. And, you know, it's something like when I was in law school, I had the highest grade in the class in legal writing. And when I was practicing law as a young, as a baby lawyer, I'd like to say, um, the older lawyers would ask me to write their briefs because they thought, even though I didn't know what the case was about, they just thought I had a better writing style than some other people. So I, I saw it early on, but I never thought about writing books until much later in my life. Now, what, what uh, made you want to major in law and pursue that path rather than English or, or writing? Eh, I just didn't see any money in writing, you know. Uh, when I, when I have to confess, when I was young and growing up in O'Brien County and, you know, my father died and, and um, I was thinking I've got to figure out a way to support myself and, you know, I want to have a profession. I, I viewed it simply. Now, you know, I work with my kids. Uh, one's now working at Nissan Corporate and the other's still in college, but I work with them to help them figure out what they want to do. For me, it was like, okay, Doctor, lawyer, dentist. Got to be one of those three. I don't yeah. want to be a dentist. So I went into pre-med for two years. And then I'm like, you know, this is too boring. And I think I felt that I was better at writing and that sort of thing then. So I'll be a lawyer. It was just that simple. You know, uh, in retrospect, I didn't even talk to any lawyers to see what they thought. Like, this is what I'm going to do. So that was pretty simple for me. Well, we're going to talk more about book publishing in a minute, but let's talk about your career in Nashville in law. What what uh, what type of law did you practice? And do you have any uh, stories you can share with us from those days? I can't really. You know, I'm, I'm tired about my clients. I can just say that um, I had, being in Nashville and being in a large firm, I had a lot of opportunities to represent country music people. Uh, and later professional athletes and just, you know, the, the, the who's who of people in Nashville and doing corporate work. Um, uh, I would also, um, you know, tax and corporate is a specialty. And then I would subspecialize with uh, tax exempt organizations, which included, you know, hospitals and religious organizations and big charitable organizations and universities and that sort of thing. So, and there weren't many people in Nashville who did that. I was probably one of three who had that as my subspecialty. So that gave me a real, a really good niche uh, in the national legal community. And, but I, of course, I have a lot of stories, unfortunately, you know, the ethical rules forbid me from discussing it, particularly online. Um, but it, it was, you know, um, it was a great experience. Uh, and it really helped me uh, research 
learn my research skills, which I use now. And also, you know, I did a lot of writing every day. I mean, a lawyer either reads, talks, or writes. So I'm doing a lot of writing for years and um, it honed the skills that I, I use now. I, I think it gave me a leg up, so to speak, and, and start transitioning to a writing career. But and that you know, I, love, I, love, I love practicing law. It was just too much work. I got lazy and I decided I'd rather write books. That was going to be my question is what about especially entertainment licensing and music publishing? And there mm -hmm. are some uh, crossovers from that business into the book publishing business. What are some of the ways that that prepared you? You know, I, we had entertainment lawyers in our firm. We had over 100 lawyers. And then, you know, staff, we had probably two or 300 people in our firm. And we had people who specialized in entertainment law. And, you know, and it's funny, I would see come in the door, the has-beens, and then you'd see the people currently, and then you'd see people just on the way up, you know. So you'd see every stage of their, and then you, um, I handled the estate of a, a, a famous uh, songwriter one time. And they brought in his book of songs. And it was about that thick, you know? And just, I was flipping through and I'd see like a 1957 song. It was a big hit, uh, you know? And so you got to meet people that you would never have met. And, you know, trying to be professional, you know, you, you got the suit on you, but you got to act it too. You know, I never asked for autographs. I never wanted my picture taken with them. I just pretended this is a business relationship and, you know, here, here, just like anyone else, you know. So uh, a lot of lawyers in my office have all these pictures with celebrities, but I just always felt I didn't want to do that. So you, a lot of people say, you know what, I want to write a book. I hear that all the time. People say, I've got a book I want to write. So at some point you thought to yourself, I've got a book I want to write. Tell us about how you got started and, and what was the motivation to finally do something that everybody else says they were going to do? Well, um, I have to throw out, of, you know, my mom, who's now 89, I don't know if she's on here or not. Um, maybe she'll send out a hello. Um, she, you know, I'm, as I'm transitioning out of law, I'm like, because you work so many hours practicing law, I'm like a cage lion. You know, I've got all this pent up energy I want to spend. So I'm like, mom, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm just like, I don't want to just go out and play golf. And, and she says, why don't you write a book? And then I thought, hmm, okay, you know, so I write a book for the family, you know, I give it to them at Christmas. It's just kind of about childhood and real foot lake and that sort of thing and they enjoyed it and I enjoyed writing it and then it gave me some serious thought about you know maybe I can make this into a second career and I, you know I had no training in English literature or writing you know post other than what you, everybody had to have in college you know and I know people who went to like the you know Yale and got their degree in literature and all this, which, you know, is somewhat intimidating. But what I learned was we're, we're all kind of on a lead, even keel when it comes to writing. And for me, I did the simplest thing. And I tell people who want to write, uh, just to, it, it, it's, a, it's a craft you have to learn. And, you know, we can all write and we can, you know, we have spell check at least now and that sort of thing. But I, what I would do is I would order books from Amazon about writing and they were by good people and it would be not only about writing but you know dialogue how to write dialogue plot scenes just all these different things and I'd read them and I'd read them again you know and then I'd write and you're, you can only improve if you write so I just kept writing it was, a lot of it was garbage but I learned from the garbage and um, and then finally uh one day I come, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. I want a book that I'm going to try to get published. And I came up with The Death of an Heir. And because I wanted something that hadn't been written before. And I like true crime. And um, so I came up with that idea. And 
you know, it turned out to be a, a good choice. Uh, it was my first book and it came out in September of 2017. You know, I'd written it on and off. I wasn't like dead serious about it. Uh, it took a long time to research and um, I would write for a while and then quit for six months and come back and write. And, you know, I'm thinking I'm just wasting my time and that sort of thing. But eventually it, it turned into something good. And then with the Exxon book, it was a totally different story. Having written one, it's kind of like, okay, now it's easy to write a book. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, your selection of the topic. Um, there's an unlimited number of topics you could have picked. What, what drew you to that particular topic for your first book? Yeah, you know, um, interesting. I, you Because you kind of walk around like a zombie expecting a topic to hit you in the face, you know, something's going to jump out at me. I don't really sit around and research topics. Um, I'm at, I've told this story when I tour, I, I was at uh, Golden, Colorado, and I do the tour of the, uh, the Coors Brewery there. Anybody that's done that tour, it's an impressive facility, and it's a beautiful area, and you go through and you look at it, and then when you finish, they have uh, like three test beers they're experimenting on and they want you to be part of the test group. So you drink the little beers, and then you write a comment card. I always tell people I went round and round and round and uh, got all the free beer. But <clears throat> when, when you leave, there's a hallway and Coors, they also made porcelain. So this is porcelain white hallway and they had all these black and white photos along the wall of Coors history from where it was founded, the founder, the son, and the grandsons. And what I found was, as I was going down the wall of fame, one of the sons dropped away. You know, he just disappeared. And uh, he was Adolf Coors III. I'm thinking, Adolf Coors III, he's the namesake. You know, what happened to him? So I went back to the hotel, and I Googled him, and then I saw the story. I'm like, wow, that's a good story. I like that. And I'm like, ah, somebody's already written it to death. And then I go on Amazon and I do a search of that topic in the books. And there's nothing. And I can't find anything. I'm like, this is it. This is going to be a good story. And, you know, um, that's how it happened. It happened just by accident. Did the uh, Coors family or the Coors company help you in any way in your research? Or did they send you a cease and desist? Uh, I kind of expected that. It's funny. I'll tell you what my brother said. Um, um, I'll throw a plug in for him, but no, they weren't happy about it. Uh, they're very private people and, you know, they're, you know, the family's a billionaire family and, you know, I'm just a little writer from West Tennessee, you know, and uh, so I was kind of expecting that. I, uh, I had to do a lot of research. I went to Denver and Boulder and, and all over Colorado interviewing people who are still alive from that period, prosecutors, defense attorneys, police, that sort of thing, anybody else that would talk to me. And the Coors family would not talk to me. Um, they were nice. Um, Pete Coors <clears throat> told me, you know, we've been burned by the press so often that, you know, we don't really want to, you know, but he was nice. And uh, our, but I wanted to speak to his uncle who was Adolf's brother, who was still alive, he lived to be 102. And but no, I didn't get any help from them. And I say in true crime, uh, both my, you know, um, Coors and Exxon are true crime books. Um, I, the third book I've just finished, I'm still rewriting. It's more his, historical. And the the thing I noticed with it versus the first two, nobody wants to talk to you. If you're the victim's family, they don't want to talk to you. They don't want to dredge up painful memories. And if you're the perpetrator's family, they're embarrassed. They don't want it to come out. They're just trying to shove it under the rocks somewhere, you know. So the only people you talk to are FBI, police, lawyers, that, you know, that sort of thing. And with my third book, it was a pleasure to be able to talk to regular folks, family. They were actually eager to talk to, you know, which I had not experienced. Are you talking about, are you sharing your subject yet or are you waiting until you're ready? Well, um, you know, this, this is keyed toward Exxon, but I'll just say it's, it's about 
I'll just throw a quick, it's about Pan Am was flying luxury planes over the Pacific on December 7th. And four of their planes got caught in the first day of the war with passengers. So I've written a book about that event from the passengers and the crew's point of view, because I went out and got the passenger lists and looked up their kids and grandkids and got their diaries and all that kind of stuff. So that's what that book is about. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, but today we're going to talk about Sydney Riso. Is that how you say yes. his name? Yes, Sydney, Sydney Riso. Riso. And we're going to go all the way back to uh, 1992. Is that right? That's right. April 1992. Okay. And tell us a little bit about the plot of the book. Of course, we don't want to get too much because we don't want any spoiler alerts, but uh, tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, my it's funny, um, with the Coors book, when I sent the manuscript in, the agent came back and said, you need to get to the action faster. You know, he likes action faster. He doesn't want you to lay a foundation. So I did. So in Exxon, the first page is the kidnapping. I mean, you, I put you into the kidnapping right off the bat, you know, so you're there. And what happens is Sidney Riso had worked for Exxon for 35 years. He was just a boy growing up in Louisiana, went to LSU, got his degree in petroleum engineering, started working for Exxon. 35 years later, he travels the world. 35 years later, he's the president of Exxon, one step away from being CEO. And he's living in Morris Township, New Jersey, which is where one of the old Standard Oil companies used to be, the predecessor of Exxon. And it's not far from New York City. So, uh, he's a modest man. He's a multimillionaire by this time. He's but he's a modest Southern boy still, and um, he's got a corporate limo at his disposal with a train driver and all that. But he, you know, he's like, I'm home in New Jersey. I've been in some bad places overseas. I don't need that sort of thing. So he drive his little compact station wagon with a five speed and roll up windows to work. But as you know, what I've gotten from writing these books is a lot of the corporate security people out there have reached out to me. And what Sidney Riso did is what a lot of people do who are kidnapped or harmed, they are a creature of habit. So every morning he would leave at the same time, go to work at about a 15 minute drive to work. And the kidnappers um, had done their surveillance. They, washed him in the mornings, they knew what time he left. And one thing he would always do is he'd pick up his newspaper at the end of the driveway uh, before he left to work. So what happens on this day, uh, he steps out of his car to pick up the newspaper and a van pulls up, screeches, man jumps out. He's got a black ski mask on, black coat, black big boots, and got a 45 caliber pistol, shoves it in his back, grabs him by the collar, slings him into the back of the van. It happens so fast. He wasn't, you know, you're, you're just trying to wake up maybe to go to work and this happens to you. So he throws him in the back of the van and Sidney Riso is 57 at this point. He's been behind a desk all his life. He's had a heart attack three years earlier. You know, he's not a strong individual. The man who is the kidnapper, one of the kidnappers, you know, 6'2", 220, big guy. Um, and so he throws him in the back of the van and Sidney Riso sees a box in the back of the van, a homemade, what I call a homemade coffin, because that's about the size of it that the kidnappers had built. Um, and when he sees that, he panics and starts to struggle and ends up being shot in the arm by this 45 caliber gun, which is no small gun. And so then he's subdued, he's handcuffed, his shot arm is handcuffed behind his back, his mouth is taped, his eyes are taped, and he's in this box now, and the kidnapper had this lattice work of ropes in the bottom of the, to keep his legs and knees pinned down so that he couldn't turn and get on his knees and try to bust out. Yeah. So he's strapped into this thing, you know, and they can't see uh, at all now. And close it, locks it shut, and they drive 
about a 30 minute drive. And where do they take them? They take them to a self storage unit and throw them out into the self storage unit. It's about a 10 by 20 unit, um, not temperature controlled. And they leave them there and they take off. And so I'm, you know, I'm thinking, okay, here you are. You're one of the most powerful corporate executives in the world. You're the president of Exxon. Going to work. And within an hour, you're shot, you're handcuffed, you're tied up, you're in a box and you're in a storage unit out in the middle of a field where you don't know where, you know, where you are. Happened that fast. And so the next day they send the ransom note and ask for 18 and a half million, which today that's about 34 million. That was the largest demand ever made in U.S. history. Uh, still is, I think. Um, and they wanted it in hundred dollar bills, which I calculated that it's like 400 pounds of money. And if you stack the bills on top and then put a brick on it, it'd be 66 feet high. Uh, that's a lot of a lot of dough to carry around, you know. And I kind of laugh because if the, the kidnappers make a lot of mistakes in the book, you'll see. Um, and one is try running off with 400 pounds of cash. You know, I mean, uh, I would rather have the money wired to Pakistan or something, you know, uh, than that, but they weren't that sophisticated. And so that's how the book starts. So, you know, wham, bam, there he is, you know, and his family, he's got a wife and five kids, his kids are grown. And, you know, they're expecting him to, go to work and come home. Well, the office calls and say, hey, where's Sid? You know, he hasn't been at work, come to work. So his wife goes out and in the driveway is his car with the door open, the engine still running, his briefcase in the back, you know? And so immediately, um, you know, there's no 24 hour waiting. You know, this is the president of Exxon. I mean, every law enforcement, you know, in, in the land swoops in, you know, from local, you got police, you got state police, you got sheriff's office, you got FBI, you got US attorney's office, you know, investigators, they're all there on the street, very nice subdivision. So, you know, think about you live in a subdivision and you wake up one morning and you look out and there's 30 cars of every insignia of police you know, in, 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 on the street. And I'm so assuming that, the kidnappers had said, if you contact the police, we'll kill you. Or we'll Oh, yeah, they always say that, you know. Yeah. And the, the FBI, they always ignore it because they like, yeah, what else are they going to say? But, you know, they, they sent the ransom note with um, Riso's Exxon credit card just to show that they had him. And, you know, they said, don't contact the police and that sort of thing. And, and they said, we want this money and we'll, get back with you. And so that's how the book opens. And then, you know, what I like to do is I, I want to put you in the investigation. You know, now you're like in the Coors book, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that are different. In Coors, I had mountains of information from the prosecution, the police, and the sheriff and everything. I had nothing from the kidnapping. You know, he didn't talk. He never talked. In uh, Exxon, ev eventually, you know, I'll give a little bit of ways. The kidnappers were apprehended. And, and it, when you have more than one kidnapper, and of course you just had one. And this one, you had more than one. And you pit one against the other, and somebody eventually says, okay, I'll talk for a lighter sentence. And I'll point the finger at everybody else. You know? And that's what happened. And when they took... Uh, the confession, it was 32 pages, single space. So I had 32 pages of what these kidnappers did from day one, you know, from stopping at Starbucks to whatever, you know, I mean, the simplest, I even know the name of their dog, you know, and so in Exxon, you have a lot more from the kidnappers perspective, what they're doing and what they're thinking that I didn't have in Coors. So that's a little different. I think that makes the story richer as well. Now, for for folks on Facebook who are just now uh, tuning in, I'm uh, from Discovery Park of America, and we're talking with uh, Philip Jett about his upcoming book, Taking Mr. X on the Kidnapping of an Oil Giant's President. 
the book will be released in May. Um, I've already gotten a couple of questions I'm going to throw at you. If anybody's got questions, you can post them in the comments or you can put them in the little question box down below. Uh, one question I think I know the answer you're going to give us, but somebody's already asked, is um, the victim still alive and are the kidnappers still alive? Um, I, I'm not going to tell you about the victim. That's, uh, that's that you're supposed to say you'll have to buy the book and find out. You know, I, I don't say that anymore. Once I said that at a, at a gathering and somebody said, I'll just Google. And, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the crowd booed this person, to which it was a lot of book lovers there. And but you're right. It, it, the what happens to the kidnapper isn't I mean, to the victim isn't revealed until much later in the book, uh, because this takes they kidnap him in April and it's not until June until they're apprehended. They keep, they keep messing up. You know, they're kind of bunglers and they mess up and then they try again and they mess up and then they try again. So, you know, he's there kind of just like, you know, I just want to go home. You know, Exxon has kidnapping insurance. And, you know, I did a, I, I, I looked at Exxon's uh, annual report that year. 18 and a half million was about a day's profit for Exxon at that time. Uh, so no big deal. You know, the money, they actually sent the money. I'm sorry, I'm getting to your other. They, you know, Exxon right away sent cash and they kept it at the house, Resource house. They had 18 and a half million in cash. Wow. And that's another story. I, I talked to the chief of the FBI. I went up to Chicago and, and interviewed him. And he talked about all the concerns just having that much money in the house. You know, not only... You know, the kidnappers might, you know, attack the house, but he was worried about his own agents dipping into the kitty, you know, kind of thing uh, with that much money. And uh, the answer about the kidnappers, yes, they're still alive. And um, one, um, one got out, uh, the one who turned evidence served 17 years and, and was out. The others are still in prison. Did you talk to them at all? I did. I reached out and uh, to the mastermind, and um, he emailed me back and forth. But um, the problem I had with him, and he might disagree, was he, he wanted to tell his version, which was totally different from what I was seeing in the facts. You know, he was trying to rewrite history, I think, as they say. And we just didn't agree. And so he went away. And that was fine with me because I you know somebody's in prison and they want to want to dictate kind of how the book goes. And that's not what I was looking for. Well, and that actually what you were just talking about ties into another question that we got from somebody. What is your process that you go through when you start researching a historical book like this? You know, um, it takes me longer to research the book and gather all the information uh, than it does to write. I can write a book in about four months. Um, and then the rewrite process takes maybe a couple more months. But to research it, it depends on the information. If the information is readily available, I can do it in about six months. But like at Coors, I found information that had, was believed to be lost. And it took me three years just to get all the information that I needed to even begin to write. Uh, but luckily in Exxon, I didn't have that problem. And um, what I've found was a lot of former FBI and um, uh, prosecutors were willing to talk to me and supply information to me that if I, I have more luck with individuals than I do with organizations. Or if I try to go through the FBI, they send me to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress says, wait, we have to find it. And then they get back to you and say, we've got to read it and redact the names. So the privacy, you know, and so that process takes forever. And then usually when you get something, it's incomplete or not what you, so i found that I'm much more lucky going through individuals. And you hit the gold mine when people are retired because they have all the files still, you know, that might, for a lot of people, that Exxon case was the biggest case they ever worked on. So when you call them up, they're happy to talk to you. And then I visit them and they pull out their files. And a lot of times they'll just give it to you because you know, it's been 
in the attic gathering dust. So that process takes a while. You know, I visit a lot of cities uh, in Exxon. I went to Chicago, I went to New York City, and I went to New Jersey. I like to go to the scene of the crime, like in Coors, I went out to Colorado and interviewed a lot of people and also just went to the places where everything happened and where they lived and that sort of thing. And I did the same in New Jersey and a retired um, uh, police detective drove me around. He was happy, he, he met me at the airport, drove me around, showed me, he was happy, you know, it was nice. He, it's nice when you have people do that for you and help you and, and so, the research process is um, painstaking, difficult, tedious, but I love it. I love researching more than I love writing, actually, I'll confess. I like finding facts that are forgotten or lost or whatever, or just bringing a lot of facts in and consolidating them and organizing them in a way that you as a reader get the information fed to you a lot of times without recognizing that you're being fed information. It's been put in a story form and, you know, hopefully enjoy it. Yeah, and that ties into um, another question that we've got from someone who's listening. On any of the books you've written, did you have any major aha moments while you were doing the research that you knew you had to put in the books? Um, well, if one thing comes to mind uh, with Exxon, I had an aha moment, but was asked by several people not to put it in the book. And so I didn't because it was very private. Um, and so I tried to respect, you know, the people in the, the particularly the victim's family, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and Coors, um, you know, it's funny, uh, in Coors, I had to find, the, get the FBI record. It took me three years to get the records from the FBI. The trial transcript, because, you know, it goes into the trial. And I, I think I haven't been that excited in years. I don't know. The older I get, it takes a lot more to excite me, I think. But <clears throat> I had searched for the trial transcript. All the lawyers said, no, don't have it. Court had destroyed it 20 years ago. Uh, I'm like, this is one of the most important trials in Colorado history. And they destroyed the trial transcript. So I'm putting ads in the paper, getting a lot of coops coming out of the woodwork. I've, you know, talked to the Colorado um, Legal Society. They put ads in their newsletters, nothing. And then one day, um, I'm digging around on the internet, and I come across something weird, and I follow it. And I think that it might be in the basement of um, a college out in Denver. And well, this has taken me almost three years you know, a process. So I call up the librarian and she says, I don't, I've never heard of that. I don't think we have it. I said, well, I, I believe it's there if you would look. And this was during the summer, there were no students at, you know. So she went and she called me back and she said, I have it. You know, it's like, I forgot, it was almost 2000 pages, I think. And uh, I was so excited. I mean, that was not necessarily an aha moment, but it was like, this is such an important part of the book. I, you know, I could use bits and pieces for newspaper reports, but now I had the actual document that I could read and pull out things that I felt were important. I'm curious um, about the process. So once you get the book written, tell us a little bit about how you, how you promote a book. How do people <clears throat> find out that you have a book for sale even? <laughs> well, that's always a problem. Um, you know, I, I didn't know anything about writing a book or certainly the, the publishing industry when I got started. And it hasn't been that long ago. Uh, and I will tell people, I always tell people, if you want to start writing, just write for the love of it, you know, it's something you enjoy. And if you want to market it, get it published, you know, there are different levels, self-publishing, Amazon's great, um, and there's other things. Traditional marketing, the big publishers, uh, is very tough for a nobody. Uh, and that's who I was five years ago. I was a nobody. I still think I'm a nobody. But anyway, I was definitely a nobody in the writing industry. 
the most important thing for me was to get a good agent. They're more important than the publisher because they find you a good publisher. You know, you don't, a writer doesn't communicate with a top five publisher. They don't want to talk to you, you know, unless you're, you know, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or whomever, you know, they'll talk to those kind of folks, but they're not going to talk to Philip Jett, you know. Um, so you get a good agent and I, I was lucky to find one and, you know, just by writing letters and saying, here's my idea, you know, kidnapping of Coors, um, you know, I, it's never been written about, uh, I've done all this research, it's never been done. And so that piques their interest. They're like, oh yeah, name recognition, everybody knows Coors name, most people, you know, instant name recognition from a marketing standpoint, because they're looking at marketing. Um, I've always said, there are people who write bad books, they get it published, because they've got a market for it, you know, or they're well known, or they have, you know, in my case, I've never really heard the word platform uh, used as much as when I started uh, writing and everybody's like, well, what's your platform? You got a website, do you have social media, do you write blogs, do you, blah, 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 you know? And I was kind of thinking, well, isn't that your job to market the book, you know? Uh, so the marketing is tough, but getting in the business, um, if you have a good subject that you really believe in your heart that, and you talk to people and say, hey, would you find this book interesting? Just like I was talking to you, I found Pan Am flying luxury planes over the Pacific on December 7th. Interesting. I didn't even know Pan Am flew planes at that time, you know, and much less these amazing planes. So when you have something like that and you bounce it off people, then you have to pull the, you know, the plug and say, okay, I'm going with it. And then Look, for me, we, we should probably point out to everybody that just getting an agent is like a Cinderella story that doesn't happen statistically, you got struck by lightning. I did, you know, and when I tell, sometimes I kid when I speak, and I haven't done it with COVID in a while, but I've, I'm invited to book fairs around the country and things. And I like to kid because as writers know, it's very tough to break in, you know, a lot of time if you're nobody. And it happened so easily for me, you know, and I feel very fortunate. It's not because of any skill, I'm not taking any credit for it. it was just, I felt very fortunate. I picked a subject and it happened to be name recognition, hadn't been written before. I found information that had never been discovered. Um, then you gotta find an agent. That's the only way you can get a top publisher. Um, and I write code letters to maybe 30 agents, describe the book, and then they want the manuscript. They may want the first 25, 50 pages. They may want the whole thing, and you send it out. And in, in my, I got a really good agent in New York, has many years of experience, um, and helped me tremendously. He was, a, he's a very nice man, in addition to a good agent. He looked at my manuscript, said, you know, you need less dialogue. You need to get to the action faster, you know, and then rewrite it and then get back with me. You know, and instead of just saying, man, I'm, you know, I'm done with you. Because he believed, he told me I believed in the project. And so I did, and then he went. And what I tell people, I, I finished writing course in 2015. It was sold in 2017, um, and I know it was, pu it was published in 2000. It was sold in, in later in 2015, but when the agent said, okay, I'm going to go try to market this, find a publisher, don't bug me. Those, those were his words, don't bug me. This process takes a while. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. That was on a Friday night. Tuesday morning, he calls me. I sold your book. You know, so when I tell people that, they're like, you know, light, lightning did strike for me because it was so easy the first time out. And, you know, and I attribute that to finding a good agent. Now, that was a that was a good moment for you. But I'm curious about the moment when you found out the New York Times 
had given you that endorsement. What was that feeling like? Well, it's funny. I was, uh, I think it, I was sleeping late that morning. I remember it. And uh, I pick up my phone and I'm looking and there's emails galore from my agent, people in the publisher and other people. And I'm like, uh oh, am I in trouble? You know, <laughs> what happened? And I look and, and um, uh, the New York Times in their Sunday paper, their book review, had included my book in their book review. And they had called it one of the best true crime stories of the year. So then I think what I did was, and people don't laugh. I'm sure you, a lot of people have dogs. I've talked to my dog quite a bit. And he's a good listener. And uh, so we went outside, and I don't know who's jumping more, me or him. And I'm like, the New York Times, the New York Times. You know? And so that's how, yeah, it was a big moment for me because that catapulted me into a different stratosphere. And it's something you can always claim, you know, uh, in the future. You know, New York Times claimed author, blah, 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 whatever, you know kind of thing and yeah, it gets got, people got struck attention. by lightning twice yeah you know i don't know what's gonna happen. I, hope, I hope i get struck again but <laughs> you know i don't want this to be the peak you know <laughs> uh, but we've got exxon out there and i'm hoping you know it does as well and uh you know i've, built, I've made some relationships over the last few couple of years and hopefully it will do as well well, several people have asked, uh, does writing books pay off financially? And that's, I'm sure, a hard question to answer because it's uh, relative. But, it is. Um, you know, it, I certainly wouldn't suggest anybody quit their day job and just write books. Um, no, because no, of the not at all. Striking uh, situation. But no. what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I was fortunate. I had a good career um, before. And, you know, I did well financially in the practice of law. And so it allowed me some room to, you know, struggle a little bit with writing. But yeah, it's it's starting to pay off, you know. And um, the more you write, my agent said, after you get three books out, you know, you're pretty good. Uh, and people recognize you more. You get more people buying, more people interested, more reviews, more everything. Um, so, yeah, don't quit your day job, even if you have a really good book. Uh, but there, if you keep working your day job and keep writing, there will be a time if you're successful that you can quit your day job. Um, I've talked to some authors. I'm not one of those. Uh, they've been writing all their lives. And a lot of them are making two or three million a year, you know, uh, with one book coming out because they've got a backlog of books. And, that sort of thing. So it can be one of those big things. And you have Dan Brown that comes out with the Da Vinci Code. That thing sold, what, 100 million copies or something? So even if you make a buck a copy, you know, you made 100 million. I mean, that's pretty rare. Uh, so the answer is don't quit your day job. But well, it, and then, and then there's also uh, movie deals and, you know, your book, both your books sound like they would be, you know, good movies or documentaries or both. Well, it's funny, you know, that's one thing you do uh, after you sell your book, then you get start getting contacted from California, uh, Beverly Hills or whatever, you know, Hollywood, and they want uh, options on the book to go out and try to find, you know, a movie deal or whatever. And, you know, of course, it was option. Nothing ever came of it, which I think is pretty common. Uh, Exxon, who knows? You know, um, but yeah, that is part of it too. Yeah, I mean, there are authors who have, you know, their books become movies almost automatically. And, uh, but then there are people who are nobodies that have written a book and their book becomes a movie or even like a series of movies, you know. And um, so, yeah, that's a possibility, but you don't really hold out. Of course, every book I write, I think, would be a good movie. I should star in it. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't really hold out a lot of hope for that. Um, we've got 10 minutes left and we've got another question. Uh, what is it uh, like promoting a book before 
and after COVID? How has COVID changed uh, the it, business? That's a great question. It's not as much fun. You know, I like, just like today, I would be there. I love people and I love talking and I love just being in, and I, I, I feed off of the enthusiasm of people that are there. And, you know, most people that come, you know, I'm not a NASCAR driver. So people that come to my events love reading or love books. And so they're interested in that. And, you know, having starting writing books, I love people who like to read. And uh, so uh, the answer really is, when Coors came out, I premiered it in Denver. So I was there. Uh, I was on the local television station. You know, I had a lot of bookstores. I did radio. I did all that stuff. And then I did other cities as well. But Denver, I was there for a week. And, you know, wine and dine, and then Tucson, and wine and dine, and all that sort of thing. And now with COVID, you know, this... Uh, Exxon was supposed to come out in September and it got pushed to May because um, <laughs> I see uh, Mary Needham's question there that Exxon premiered at Discovery Park. There you go. Um, and um, so I miss, that's part of the joy. Some people don't like it. I do like it. And it's not really a vanity thing. It's just, you know, you, you like to see people appreciate your work and you you hope that when you write this book readers will enjoy it and so I enjoy being there in person at these events and now with you know my book being pushed to May and I hope it doesn't get pushed again I think it's a solid date that's what I'm told and um, you know I'm doing zooms and I'm doing podcasts and that sort of thing which you know I enjoy this very much but it's not the same as being there. So also and, a lot of people like to attend book talks and get the author to autograph the book. Um, and obviously you can't sell us a book that you have autographed personally to us in this moment. So I think that right. would impact it a little bit too. Well, you know, I, I will be more than happy to come to Discovery Park after COVID is done and sign every book anybody gives me, you know, it'd be my honor to do that. But yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's really weird because um, when I premiered my first book, I was going to an event in Boulder, Colorado. And you walk by the library, they got a beautiful library there um, and uh, bookstore. And they had my book in the front windows, you know, da, da, da. and then you walk in and they had this big display of my books. And I remember turning around, walking back out and walking down the street because I was overwhelmed by just seeing your book, this thing you had worked on in your t-shirt and shorts at your desk now displayed and people coming to hear you speak. And, you know, that's, I don't know, it's a very rewarding thing to be there in person. Uh, but this is a, a good second best. Yeah, we'll, we will definitely have you to Discovery Park uh, for another book launch party, preferable out at the train station. Yeah, uh, you know, I did that with Coors, you know, yeah. I did that at the train station. I did that. Did uh, they, sir? You weren't, you they, weren't there. They, they cur Coors beer. That's what I was wondering. If you close that yeah. loop. I guess we can fill up our cars with Exxon gas. I don't know. But. <laughs> That's right. In the uh, rest of the time we have left, uh, you know, Discovery Park of America's mission is to inspire children and adults to see beyond for any anyone who's listening who who wants to uh, write that book. What what is your advice to them that they need to start doing right away? Well, for young people like when I was young, I gave the examples of my teachers, you know, and I hope there are teachers still out there as good as the ones, you know, Hornbeak Elementary. Uh, simple school, uh, simple times, uh, but teachers who really um, took an interest in students. And, and as a child, whether you want to be an athlete or whatever it is, you know, you, you have certain dreams. Uh, just if you want to write, just start writing. Show it to your parents, show it to your friends, see what they think, and then pursue it. And then, you know, when you're in college, just keep 
the dream going, you know. Uh, for me, I didn't follow that course. I mean, I can tell people, if there's, you're never too old to write. Uh, I hope that I can write until I don't remember who I am. Um, you know, so uh, just as they say, follow your dream. Uh, don't think that people are better than you just because you're starting and there's no chance that somebody from Old Byron County can't get in the loop, you know. Um, uh, so that would be my say. I came from Old Byron County years ago and, you know, I'm, I have a top five publisher and and went to Hornbeak Elementary, no Byron County Central, and I had good teachers that helped me along. Now, for anybody who wants to follow you um, and and know when your book's coming out, and what's the best what's the best way to track you down online? Uh, my website uh, www.philipjet that's one l two t's dot com, and it's got uh, information about both my books, and um, the course book will also be coming out in paperback this year. So I've got kind of a bunching of books going on right now. And then I've got the third book that I'll let you know about on my website as well. But right now, I would appreciate it. Uh, it'd be a big favor for me as a writer who, who sweat over, the, you know, taking Mr. X out. If you go out there and pre-order it at uh, any outlet that you'd like, you know, a lot of people go to Amazon, but it's also at walmart.com and barnesnoble.com and others, you know, please do. And uh, then see me back at Discovery Park and we'll have some fun. That sounds fantastic. And for anybody who's watching who doesn't know about Discovery Park, you can find out more about us at discoveryparkofamerica.com and follow us on Facebook. And then when we have that big event with Philip to launch his book here at Discovery Park, you'll be among the first to know. So, and Philip, thank you so much for being here uh, and spending a little time with us today. Oh, well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody that tuned in today. I appreciate your interest, taking time on your lunch hour and uh, giving me, uh, letting me come into your life. I appreciate it very much. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye.